This is Will Spencer from the Renaissance of Men here in Orlando, Florida with the 21 Summit 2021. This is a panel on women and femininity related to the 22 conference, 22 convention going on just next door. I'm here with Socrates, Alexander Cortez, Pastor Michael Foster, and President Anthony Dream Johnson. And uh, all of us spoke at the 22 convention. And so let's just go down the line and I'd like each man to say like sort of the topics that you spoke about and how you see it related to femininity today. So let's start with uh, you, Socrates. I actually spoke about a universal subject of us uh, civil resistance and in particular uh, the value that women innately have in the act of civil resistance that because of their uh, gender specific elements of uh, socialization, the empathy, uh, their network and um, alliance building capabilities, they're uniquely positioned to contribute highly to a nonviolent campaign. And that's particularly important when we look at the success ratios associated with campaigns. Is that typically if you have three point, or I'm sorry, yeah, 3.5% of a population, typically you're successful in overturning a government. And if we're looking to institute cultural change, we need higher populations, and women can absolutely not only provide that population number, but actually add significantly to the value of a campaign to achieve those goals. And that's uniquely kind of specifically towards women. And I hope that they are hearing that message. And when I talk about typically in dating relationships where men and women are compatible and complementary, this is completely true in civil resistance campaigns. Mm -hmm. And just to make sure, you said three to five percent. Was that the number? Three, f three to five percent to overturn a government. I wow. have to believe that it's actually less to change a culture. So, mm. um, and what's important there is that when you look at normal nonviolent campaigns, most of them are populated by 1.6 of the per percentage of the population. So you're already halfway there if you just have a nonviolent campaign, and I think that's going to be enough to actually change society and culture. So the the premise is is that I think we're already there we just haven't coalesced mm -hmm. let's uh let's go through each man's speech and then we'll kick some ideas around so ajac you want to go next yeah uh, my speech was generalistic and sort of this advice giving for young women i mean if i was to take like a broader meta perspective it's been very interesting to see the past probably the past five years whereas the mass sphere obviously content was geared towards men and mm -hmm. there's this sure. constant theme of men growing up with uh, single moms, men without fathers, not having a father figure. But the same thing has happened to women. You know, men are not the only ones that don't have dads. And what I've seen online now the past few years, it's been really uplifting and it's, it's a positive development, is that you have this sort of general awakening of women realizing that, you know what, we've been given very bad advice mm -hmm. by society, by our mothers, just by this sort of cultural narrative that you know caters to this, you know, global homo kind of story of career, work, you're going to pay taxes if you can basically contribute to this, you know, capitalist system we live in, like that's how you're a good person. Right. You know, you put off motherhood, you are the most important thing in the universe. Having, you know, children, when that happens, it happens way later. Uh, you know, relationships are something that you take seriously in your 30s, not your 20s. And you have a lot of these young women today realizing, like, we've really been lied to. Because either I've seen relatives do that, do that version of life and it hasn't turned out well, or I've done that version of life and it's made me really unhappy and I'm not fulfilled. And why were we taught these things? You know, like why is this the social order? And so they're looking for their own answers. They're trying to find people, trying to find women that, that you know, give, give a different account, you know, different advice. And most of what they're finding right now is actually men. And it's been really interesting where they, you have all these women on the periphery of like the male sphere, where they're not really coming for the male advice to learn about men specifically. Mm -hmm. They're coming because you, you guys actually give very good paternal advice, mm -hmm. like you, you're a paternal figure, and your instruction is way better than anything I'm gonna find you know, on, the, on the general internet, general web. And they're really listening, they're very receptive. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's just been really cool. Like I've been surprised at the segment of my audience, which it's probably about 80% men, but that 20% the rest, it's women. And it's a lot of young women. And if I'm being honest, they're kind of like looking for a dad, big brother. Mm. Because they just don't have that in their life. Mm. Yeah, it's really made me take a step back and reconsider, you know, like how I present, you know, what I present and who I'm talking to. Where, yeah, we can talk all day about how bad it is for men. It's probably arguably worse for women. <laughs> in many ways, you know, yeah. Because women are also discouraged from listening to men in the first place. Yep. You know, like it, it's a normal thing for a man to listen to a man. Women are actively told, basically, don't take men seriously mm -hmm. at all about anything unless they already agree with everything you think and feel and say. Mm -hmm. So they put themselves in this very isolated position where they don't know how to take advice, even when they need it, and they don't know how to ask questions, but 
they're unhappy, something's wrong, what, what do I do? Mm-hmm. And the feminist ideology really preys on women almost most of all, right? Yes, I, well, feminism, like, we could go on that for a long time, but yeah. it's evolved into like this late stage companion to like global homo capitalism. Mm-hmm. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, no, that's all it is. It doesn't, no, it is because it doesn't, it's not empowering. There's nothing empowering about it. Yeah. Like if you look at actual t- statistics, like let's be objective and use numbers, like more women are in college. Yes. More women are joining the workforce than men. Yes. You know, me, more women are getting degrees. Yes. Women are outperforming men in K through 12. Yes. The, the entire system is oriented towards women. Like, like you won, like you got everything you wanted. Yeah. So at this point it's now like, what is it? It's complaints of. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's complaining about the patriarchy. Yeah, it's complaining about it's complaining about the heterosexual male patriarchy. Well, well I, I'm uncomfortable. Or you know what? In in this particular industry, there's not enough women here. We need more parity here. Mm-hmm. Like you, you're already making more money. Like you, you already have all the economic advantages. So now you're looking for grievances. Well, AJ, AJ, it's become about man, man spreading, man splitting, like a litany. Yeah, it's it's stupid, become about really bullshit. Shit. It's about yeah. bullshit. Now we're, we're, we're going to complain about your body language. We're going to complain yeah. about tone. Yeah, we're going to complain about the male gaze. Mm. We're going to complain that well, be, being heterosexual, like that, that's uncomfortable. Why is James Bond a man? Like that's what yeah. they now they have to make James Bond a woman. Like this is crazy. Yeah. That, that was personally fucking heartbreaking. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, to even talk about that it hurts me. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you saw Daniel Craig's whole thing with like, I go to gay clubs because you know I've, I'm, you know, herder toxic masculinity. Did you see that those headlines? Mm. I did. Yeah. yeah. Was, I mean, uh, I, I mean I'll, I'll I'll defend him a little bit. Okay. Because I'll, I'll say this if, I, because I know guys that grew up in the UK and like you know Britain, and they have a really heavy drinking culture. Sure. And it, fighting is actually a very, very, very common thing. Mm-hmm. Like they're super degenerate that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm like, I was like, I, 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 I have friends that are British, Irish, and they're like, you know, like I, I kind of understand what he's saying because that's, just, that's like the thing that you do here as a young guy. You go out, you get really drunk, you vomit, you fight in the street. And it's just like, that's, that's what's expected. So, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, what'd yeah. you talk about 22? Um, I, I've read a lot of books in the men's space. I talked about um, King Warrior, Magician Lover, and in Fire in the Dark, uh, The Sky Father, The Lord of the Earth and the Striker, and Protect, Provide, Preside from Ryan Mickler, and um, let's see, what else did I get into? Uh, Rugged, Refined, and Rakish by Tanner Guzzi, and then Alison Armstrong's Stages of a Man's Life, which are Page, Knight, uh, Prince, King, and Elder. And I looked at all those different archetypes and I said, what do these all say about men? They're all heroic archetypes that live within men. They live within all men. And this is not something that uh, needs to be that needs to be taught to men. It's something that's innate to us. But for some reason, it's not coming out in men these days. And uh, I, I put the, the, the question to women, what if there was something, some language of heroes, which is from Alison Armstrong, that you could learn to bring out the best in men? And so I asked, would you be willing to learn, learn this language? And the women of the audience said yes. And I said, there's one catch. You have to take a vow. And this is from Alison Armstrong's book, The Queen's Code. The vow is, I uh, will never castrate, I will give up the right to castrate men forever. The point being, if a woman wants to bring out the best of any man in her life, she has, she has to actively and forever give up the right to shame him or she will never see the best in him. And the, she has to make that commitment. And that's a very, very tough thing for women to give up because as I talked about in my 21 talk, shame is the power that women have over men. And it's a very, very difficult thing for many women to give up. And we've seen it spread all throughout society right now. It's in the media. It's in our language. Toxic masculinity is a shaming term. It's everywhere. It's the water that we're swimming in. And so that, that power is wielded primarily by women. And so I put it to the women, are you willing to give this up? It seemed to me that many of the women were, and which was very positive to see. Um, but there's a lot more to that. So I asked that question, I put it to women, what if you have some responsibility for bringing out the best in men? And are you able to get what you want from life out of men at the point of a knife? And uh, I, I think that that message uh, landed, at least I hope it did. So that's what I talked about. Cool. <laughs> it was, I heard it went over pretty smooth, man. You were a smooth operator at 22. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I had to, you know, I, in my 21 talk, 
you know, I knew that I could be a bit more strident and a bit more outspoken with the men. Mm-hmm. But as I was getting ready for that talk, I realized that taking a, a really like strident tone doesn't quite hit the same for women because women do feel threatened, you know, by men who speak in, in anger, even if it's righteous anger. And that's natural because women have this instinctive fear of men's power naturally because men are quite powerful. It's just part of our genetic lineage. So it's like, well, what if I dial it back and speak a little softly and that the words and the concepts speak for themselves? And I, and I think that the, I think that did. And I think they did. So um, I was happy to discover that technique, I guess you might say. What this linebacker talk about? Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to give women some hope. I think as I look at our culture, our society, that's what I want to give men, too, is hope. I uh, have slowly realized how, how blessed I am. I, I married uh, my high school sweetheart. I married her, she was a virgin, we're still married, we have a lot of kids and, and we're happy. And the reality is that most people don't get that today. They have sexual pasts, they made mistakes, they've been divorced, um, things have happened. And sometimes in this space, it's, uh, it's like you've, you've missed the boat, you're wore out, you, know, you're not, you don't have any more value, you can't ever put your life back yeah. together. And if that's true, we're, we're kind of screwed, yeah. right? Because it's, it's a whole generation mm-hmm. that this has happened to. And so as I, wa- I want to encourage women as much as I encourage men, I said this, I don't know if this is true. It's catchy though, it'll, it'll tweet. But um, I, said that, um, I said that men are more hated than women, but women are more lied to than men. Yeah. And I don't know if it's totally true, but I, feminism is an attack on femininity, right? Mm-hmm. And they're trying to teach women to hate themselves as well. Mm-hmm. And they've, they've, they've bought into it. Us, we, us men are fighting it. That's why they're turning up the heat on t- things like toxic masculinity. Mm-hmm. So you're not natural. Uh, but so what I, I kind of got on the, the Twitter spear, you know, on, on people sort of noticed me when I had a tweet about single mothers. Uh, and I tell men to be very careful about dating single mothers. I caution them. Uh, and they needed to ask, why is she a single mother? Is it because her husband died? Is it because she made some uh, poor decisions? Or what, was he a creep? Was he a weirdo? Or was she a prostitute? Was she a whorish, right? Is she a bad person? Um, and so I said that, and uh, I guess the right people retweeted it. It was USA Today, Daily Wire, got Allie Beth Stuckey thought I was a terrible person, you know. And, You're and doing all these something people. right. <laughs> yeah, right. So it, uh, it took off. And I got this email like a week or two ago that helped me figure out what to talk about at 22 from a woman that um, apologized for hating me. It was this long email, like, I hated you, Pastor Foster. And she had been married to a man who was, who was nuts and not well and abusive in a lot of different ways. And she eventually fled the relationship. The man killed himself because he, he wasn't of sound mind. And, and she becomes a Christian, this is like 2019, and then sees my, my tweet. And she said it felt like I was scaring all the good men away from her. <clears throat> and then she finally finds a guy that likes her, mm-hmm. that invests in her. And she, she gets nervous because she knows she's a liability to him. And she starts to caution him, more or less. And she realizes I'm right. <laughs> I'm mm, right. Wow. She even knows that she's a problem, right? Um, but they, but they, get, they get married and they're happy and they're rebuilding. They're rebuilding their life. And uh, the, the metaphor I think of often is those shows where you reclaim wood or metal, mm-hmm. right? It's from something rubble that broke down and you can make something beautiful from it. If we can't work with the people we have right now, uh, how, what are we yeah. going to do? Because it's, it's almost an entire generation. Yeah. I mean, millennials on, on whole are so jacked up. Um, they, they, you know, you hear the boomers make fun of them and Gen X just have kind of checked out. Um, but they're so, they've had so much, so many lies, whether it's student loans or whatever, um, thrown at them that we have to be able to work with people that are not coming from ideal situations. Yep. So I wanted to encourage the women to re- rebuild from the rubble. I gave them two areas to work on, um, and they're both related to volume. One was attire. So you can think of modesty as a sound, right? So music sounds good at a certain level. Sta- mm-hmm. Turn down too much, mm-hmm. then you can't hear it. If it's turned up too much, then it hurts your ears, right? Awesome. So modesty is the same thing. A woman shouldn't be ashamed of her feminine beauty. She should, she should embrace it. Mm-hmm. She should be ashamed of her, hip, her hips, her lips, right? Her breasts, none of that stuff. But she shouldn't also just let everything hang out. Right? That will attract the wrong type of man. It will not 
it will not attract a quality man. Absolutely. Right. And, the opposite. And, yeah. Do the, he, he'll say that's danger right there. Yeah. It's just like blue hair says that's danger. And that, and then to encourage them that it's, you see this in irritating trad Twitter, right? <laughs> like TradCon Twitter makes you want to die. It's like, <laughs> it's like pictures of some perfect woman and some perfect guy, like in the Swiss Alps and this cute little baby. Sundress. This is all I want. But that's what most people want, okay? Because it's, yeah, it's a dream. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you see women, they grow their hair out and they put their dress on and they start, you know, throwing these memes out or whatever. Uh, but their attitude is still yep. really a feminist attitude. They're Bingo. a loud woman, okay? Bingo. And yeah. then they think by putting it on, so then guys resent them and say, really deep down, you're still the whorish woman you were, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and in a lot of cases, even if they're not sleeping around, they do have that attitude. So I wanted to tell them, like, I kind of rather you have short hair and wear jeans and have a beautiful feminine deference mm -hmm. than the other way around, if you're gonna have to choose. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to encourage them not to be Mrs. Wrong, right? If, she, if we're going to rebuild, we have to encourage women. We have to, we have to lay a path forward with where we're at. So that was what I focused on. I love that. Prez? Yeah, that was extremely well spoken. That's going to be tough to follow up about recapping his entire speech. I did get to see some of it too. Um, I did actually, so my speech was a sequel to my keynote uh, last year at the first 22 convention. So my speech at the first one, my keynote last year was called Motherhood First, hashtag Motherhood First. And that was about encouraging young women to put motherhood first rather than put motherhood last, which is what feminism tells them to do through covert, these manipulation and means. They lie to them, they kind of hide information, all this BS. Women, young women today basically make very uninformed decisions about building a family, relationships, all this stuff. They put college first, career first, advanced schooling first, and they put motherhood last to the point that they freeze their eggs, try to unfreeze them, it fails very often, and they're crying. Drinking cheap wine, eating cat food, petting cats. They have the. They have. <laughs> there's a meme where she's eating the cat food. She's like so delirious. She's like drinking like the box wine, that shitty dollar store wine. Still and, better than uh, eating cats. Yeah, then the cats eat you and you die. I'm actually a cat. That's the whole thing, but. But this is a real thing. Women today are really taught to put, they'll know, the feminists will never admit this, but if you actually give an honest look at what they teach young women through different yes. social means, music, movies, TV, entertainment, school, propaganda, whatever, motherhood's last, right? Career first, school first, motherhood last. They'll never put in those terms, but that's what they teach them. Now, my speech this year was a follow-up to that. It was a direct sequel, and it was called Make Women Virgins Again. It has nothing to do with being a born-again virgin, it's just not like related to the talk. That's a whole separate issue. I mentioned it a little bit, but it's just not part of what it is. It's about revaluing virginity in America and in the West for women specifically, without even mentioning men. And I went into this, uh, this, this point in particular because I've been wearing this hat for a few months and I love this hat. It's my favorite new hat this year. Uh, make Women Great Again is always going to be true to my heart, the closest to my heart, but Make Women Virgins Again enrages people to a degree I have never seen. Even, really, it is amazing. <laughs> they, they love it or they hate it. It is, it is it's not just enraging. That's not fair. It's super polarizing. Some people love it. Young guys in their 20s, when I'm out of bars with this hat, they fucking love it. They come up to me, high-fiving me, taking selfies with me, and boomers as well. Boomers as well love it. Older women, older men want to go to these political conferences. They think it's hysterical. And in their day, it was a lot more normal. So it, it's, it's interesting. Anyway, my talk was about you know, without even mentioning virginity for men, I was like, this is not even a thing, right? Let the Christian men take care of it. We'll talk about it later. That's fine to tackle later. I'm talking about female virginity in America. It's about revaluing that because I think that's integral to how feminism has warped and changed American culture and particularly American women. Millennial and Zoomer chicks give a fuck less about it. Pardon my French. They don't care. Even a lot of the Christian girls, they could care less. I have buddies in Orlando who are Christian. They go to these, uh, these redneck bars with me sometimes, like cowboys and stuff. The same Christian girls on Saturday night getting, getting shit-faced, making out with guys, banging them, they go to church Sunday morning, right? They don't care at all. They lost their virginity at 14, 15, 16 years old. It means nothing to them, all right? I think this is biologically unsound and it's dangerous for women. I think femininity needs to, be, needs to be preserved, and the foundation of that is virginity and chastity. And young women today don't care, a lot, especially if they're secular. They could care less. It's, if you, it's virginity to them and retaining it beyond beyond the age of 18 is like alien to them. You might also be speaking Chinese. So this speech was designed to push back against that from a secular perspective, not a religious one. 
Like I'm not, these, most of these guys are Christian. I'm not, I'm an atheist, uh, atheist objectivist. This is about common sense femininity, American femininity for women, and revaluing something that they've completely lost to the point, like Michael's saying, that these generations are millennials and Zoomers. A lot of this stuff is just alien to them. They have no, they've been lied to. They received compound lies. Their mothers were lied to, and their mothers then either fed them those lies indirectly or directly, or whatever the mechanisms were, however it went. So this is like the first time I think this has been pushed back against from a secular position, and I mean it. You know, I, I want to live, I like living in a free country. I want to continue living in a free country. If women want to act like skanks and throw this shit out the window, so be it. But stop punting those things, to, those responsibilities, uh, offloading them. They're welfare mechanisms and all these things. And I think it's self-destructive, women acting like skanks. It's bad. And it's much better to preserve your, fem your virginity and your femininity if you can. And, but it, like Michael said, too, like I talked about um, his speech from last year, actually, in my speech. And he basically said that, you know, it's going to take decades to reverse and fix the damage feminism has done. It won't be done overnight. No matter how viral the video goes and how much impact we have, no matter how many people I enrage in the media and stuff with little bears and pigs and hats and stuff. <laughs> like, real change on a macro level and a micro level, on a cultural level and a personal level, real change takes real time. Like, not just months or even years, but decades, generations even. And that's why he's saying, I think it's what he's saying, Michael is saying is important, is that you have to learn, we have to learn how to deal with broken people. And at least if young girls see this, my speech about making women virgins again, because, you know, some YouTuber like Curtis Connor or the media is, you know, mad about it, who cares? At least they're exposed to the information. At least they can make, maybe make a better decision. 2%, 5%, 10% of them, right? The rest of them probably won't. They're going to ignore it. They're going to scream at it, downvote, get mad at me. Who cares? If some of them will listen, though, and that's at least a first step to moving things in the right direction, to living a better life and making better choices for yourself as a female, as a birthing person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I want to put a question um, out to the panel, and, and uh, you know, Michael, you kind of touched on it. Sort of, what is the path back? What is the path back for women who have, let's say, fallen? Because a, a lot of women of the three successive generations, possibly four now, have absorbed and been born into feminist ideology, and they're discovering, you know, uh, Alexander, as you said, that they're not happy, and they're looking for a way forward, and so they find, they find the manosphere, they find 22 convention, 21 convention, all the men in this space, and they say that sounds like a path that I want to walk to find, a, let's say, a high-value man, or maybe they listen to Kevin Samuels or something like that. And this is a path towards a life that I want to lead. You know, uh, uh, be a mother, uh, be a homemaker, you know, be, be someone passing on values to the next generation. But I have this past, and I don't know, what, like this is the woman's perspective, I don't know what to do about it. Maybe a high-notch count, or maybe tattoos, or maybe a child, or something like that. Something that can't be undone. And so I think a lot about this question, like, well, if a woman finds herself in that position with something that can't be undone, but wants to move in this direction and find a man from this community who wants to build a life with her, what's the path back for her? Is there one? Can we, can we come up with one spontaneously here? Or have you guys thought about this? Because that door needs to be open. Because I, I feel like sometimes things can get a little, I, I don't know, I'll call it autistic in the men's space, where it's like you have to have the trad virgin born into the high values family. And it's like, okay, yeah, so there's like a dozen of those, you know? <laughs> like, so what, what about the rest of us? You know what I mean? And, Michael's and, got a bunch at his church, man. He's collecting them. <laughs> What's church? Where's your church again? <laughs> we'll take it off. I have some ideas on this. Yeah, please. I'm, I'm very curious because I think it's the sort of thing that women who want to move in this direction would potentially need to hear so they feel that there's an open door to come and participate. And just, I just want to say one thing. I think there's going to be a, a need for discussion for forgiveness from men around it as well, which I'd like to touch on at some point. Like yeah. men, men for offering forgiveness to women and understanding. So my first thought is, number one, don't lie. And, yeah. you know, women basically, men tend to pump their numbers up. You know, if they have a notch count, they try to brag to each other, they pump them up. Even in movies in the 90s, like American Pie, right, guys would triple it. Girls would basically divide it by three, right? So if she had said sex with 24 guys, it becomes eight. Nine becomes three, things like this. Don't lie. Don't live, a, don't live life of a fake reality. It is what it is. You're never going to undo it. History is history. You can't change it. If you try to warp it, you're just going to warp your own life and screw it up and screw someone else up and abuse them. Don't lie. Lying is abuse, especially in a relationship. Mm. Number two, have realistic expectations. This is one of the main uh, cultural things that has happened to women, I think, directly from feminism. They have completely unrealistic expectations, particularly through online dating apps, but even in person. They're, just, they're basically delusional. 
Like feminism has made women super entitled and they have, they've massively overvalued themselves in the sexual marketplace. Socrates, I think in particular, could speak to this as a, I read a whole book on the sexual marketplace. I mean, literally it's in the, on the sale on that side. 20, 20 bucks, go buy it now. Um, yeah, they need to have realistic expectations. They don't. In other countries, they do. Like the woman, you know, uh, John Anthony, a pickup artist speaker, was talking about women in places like Poland, uh, Eastern Europe, basically. Women there are way in way better shape physically and psychologically. They expect men to act like men. They don't yell at them about toxic masculinity. They're very courteous. They're very respectful. I spent a month there in 2019 uh, for 21 convention. And uh, their, their expectations are more realistic and they're from a better physical and psychological position. They're not, they haven't been warped by feminism. They hate communism in Poland, for example. They hate it. And they see a connection, most of them, to feminism and communism. So they don't have it, these uh, unrealistic expectations, and women in America do. And this is where you see things on Instagram and social media and all this stuff. I don't need no man and blah, all this kind of crap, right? All this, this really obnoxious garbage. Hey, hey Anthony, you yeah. asked me to keep things moving around the panel and to cut men off if I needed to. No, yeah. you know, just because you asked me to. So I, I, you know, since you, since yeah. you mentioned Socrates, like I want to send it yeah, back over good. to Socrates and, and say what your thoughts on this are, like a path back or whatever you want to say, because I think it ties into your themes as well. Yeah, I, I think you have to start with where you're, where you're at. You, know, you 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 can want to be somewhere else, but you have to start wherever you're at. And uh, you know, I th my first talk at D22 Con was literally uh, that the the dose determines the poison. You know that that how much of feminism are you in taking and ingesting? Wow. And it you know you can it's a poison that doesn't kill immediately. You know, it's a poison that actually has some benefit initially, uh, but you know, taken in consumption. Uh, it's terribly toxic and fatal, uh, you know, and so in many ways um, I've been thinking I've been asked to kind of write an article about some of this and I was kind of going over it on my head last night and thinking that in many ways feminism is very much uh, the fast food of ideologies. It's cheap, <laughs> so it's good. fast, and it's nourishing when you have need. Uh, and, and, and quite honestly, it's, it's something you can enjoy. Um, and it's, it's a franchise that you can own immediately. Any woman can choose to identify with it right now. And as a franchise, it comes with a massive brand. Uh, I think these are all compelling reasons to kind of be, uh, you know, be allured towards feminism. And not only that, it comes with a sisterhood with it. You know, it comes with uh, the value of unearned virtues of, of being a victim. Uh, so you have all that, uh, but ultimately I think it's very unhealthy and unfulfilling. Uh, it's detrimental over time. Uh, and so how do you tell somebody who's been living on fast food culture of feminism, how do you get off of that? Uh, and, and it may be all at once, it may be parts and pieces, uh, you know, and, and I'm not saying you can't go back and have fast food, you know, um, you know, enjoy it from once in a while, but understand that, you know, what you consume, you end up becoming. Um, and I would start with where you're at and take an honest look. Are, are your results getting you where you want to go? You know, what type of person have you become? Um, I, in my talk last year, I, you know, looked and I know Arthur did the same thing. I was amazed that he had some of the same images as well. Uh, is this, let's, let's measure feminism, you know, to sit down and say, is it truly improving women's lives? Has it been good for women? Uh, and really measure it. And particularly when you can look at the, 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 the real toxic range of what's taken place. Um, it could be de very, very debilitating. So, you know, I, w I would start with, you know, what are your consumption patterns? Be honest about it and sit down and say, very much like nutrition, maybe you need to make some dietary ideological changes. Alexander? You know, this, this question of redemption comes up a lot. Since, like, that is what the question is. Like, you know, I've, yeah. I've, been, a, I've been a bad girl. I can't be redeemed. I, you know, this has a certain parallel to like the men that are weak. Like I've been, a, I've been a beta bitch soy boy. Like, can I become a real man? It's like, <laughs> yeah. Like, are you, are you willing to do the work? Like, are you willing to do the work? You know, mm. the, the problem for a lot of women, you know, taking out you know, the isms standpoint is that what I see a lot with a lot of women, you're not lovable. There's nothing about you that's worth loving. You're narcissistic. You're hyper narcissistic. Mm -hmm. You're entitled. You operate under a paradigm in which you cannot be judged or shamed for literally anything you do. Everyone has to agree with you. The man has to agree with you. But then you have all these expectations of wanting to be loved still. Women live to be loved. They want to be loved. But there's nothing about you that's lovable. 
So you need to take a very hard and probably painful look at your life and consider what are my values, what are my choices, what are my beliefs, and what action needs to change. I had a woman that contacted me recently where she was very upfront about like her past life. She's had a lot of sexual partners. She was a careerist. Uh, she has, you know, she has tattoos. She has all these things. You know, I told her like the tattoos. I, I don't overestimate tattoos. Tattoos, you can get tattoos, whatever. Piercings, I don't care. Yeah, you know, what, what you're realizing though is that you have devalued yourself. You've treated your body as an object. You've made poor choices of relationships. It's left you feeling empty. Like you've actually recognized all this. Okay, like do you think you can change? And do you believe that if you do that, that a man, you know, will find you worth loving? I would never tell anyone like you're not going to be ever worth loving ever. You're useless but you might have a lot of work to get there. You know, men have to pass as well. We're not, we're not all perfect beings. I'm, I'm not God. I'm not here to tell you that you're a whore and you are barred from heaven. How, you know, how dare you? You're going straight to hell. That, that's not what we're here for. You know, but I will tell you that, yeah, you, you fucked up a lot. And now you're going to have to be objective you know, and reconsider how you lived your life. And you know what? Maybe, maybe my values are bullshit. You know, maybe my mom was kind of a bitch. Yeah, maybe how I've treated men, treated myself is you know, the wrong way of living. Yeah. And, like, and you have to be objective. Yeah, this is the problem that a lot of women have is they're very passive in this process. And this is kind of like the, like the joke about the triad con. It's like, oh, okay, like, so if I just put on like a long dress and post some picture about mm-hmm. baking bread, like now I'll get a good guy. I'm like, you're, you're, still, you're still the same bitch. You're just in a dress. Send, you haven't changed. Send tweet. <laughs> So yeah, that's my question to women when they contact me, like, okay, like, I'm glad you're reaching out, like, are you going to do the work? <laughs> yes or no? Yeah, that's on you. Mike? Sure. Um, we, we have a, we don't understand marriage. Do you understand marriage? Is marriage about uh, fulfillment? Is it about self-fulfillment? <clears throat> if marriage is about self-fulfillment, your marriage is going to fail, bottom line. Mm. Um, marriage has to have a telos. It has to have a purpose. It has to go and work towards something. It's got, it can't, if it's inward, it's going to fail. It's going to collapse in on itself. And it's got to have a purpose. Uh, uh, this is the teaching of Christianity, but the ancients knew this, right? That a household was to raise a, up a legacy, raise up children and to build something. And men and women stuck together. Uh, when a woman was, so uh, you ladies are going to lose your beauty, Right, men, you're gonna you're gonna lose your strength. It's gonna happen. But when you invest your beauty and strength in each other early on, or as early as you can, uh, it's replaced with strength of character, beauty of character. Eventually, mm-hmm. a problem I have with the man is fear is you're all gonna die. You're all gonna die. Right? We're all gonna die. We we have what our views on these things are so short, yeah. and and they're so small. So we're gonna have to get to bigger questions eventually. Mm-hmm. But first, change the way we look at marriage. Uh, having the purpose, my marriage, I'm building a household uh, for my grandkids, my great grandkids. I'm invested. My wife's invested in me. It's bigger than both of us. Mm-hmm. Xenophon, uh, he, he wrote in his book on household orders, very famous uh, ancient book, and Xenophon, and it says, without my wife would die, and everyone swoons. But he meant it. Mm-hmm. Without my wife, I'd die. I can't, I'm, I'm a really bad mother. Mm-hmm. Not good at being a mother. And Em sucks at being a dad. Right? We need each other. My kids need mothers and fathers. And so part of the problem, if you're looking for a man to complete you, mm-hmm. right, a man can't redeem you. Just like a woman, like as, as in a husband, there is a man that can redeem you. But as in a husband, he can't. And a woman, just like the men think the women um, are going to validate their manhood, right? women think if they get a man, that's going to validate their womanhood. Mm-hmm. But you have to start to understand that what God gave you, feminine nature, it's good. Uh, to Anthony's two points is basically responsibility and reality, right? Take responsibility for what you did. Uh, in redemption, that's a big part. I sinned. What I did was wrong. I confess it. I admit it. I own up to it. I deserve what comes my way. Uh, so women definitely have to do that. And I don't, you could be so happy. It's like when I talk to the MGTOW guys, yeah. you know, I'm like, you could be happy. I know you don't think you can be, but I've seen 40 somethings get married and be happy. Yeah. Right, and have a wonderful time. And you do have to change your expectations to, to not just fit your reality, but the reality. It's not like, hey, you had your chance to get a top-notch guy, but you screwed around in your youth. Mm-hmm. Right, we all get old. Right, we all wear down. And, and I'm, I'm going to die next to my wife. Right, hopefully not in a car. Because socks every once in a while, you need to flirt with feminism. And we went on a trip 
last year, and I let her drive for a little bit. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. A little drunk food. Let her drive. All right. Well, okay, I'll, I'll take that from there. Wow. <laughs> sure, I'll just take on that one. No, I mean, you know, what, what I'm going to say probably isn't going to be popular, and, and I, don't, I, I don't expect it to be, and it's a very unpopular word, and, and, and the word is accountability. And, uh, you know, feminism said for a very long time that women wanted to be equal to men. It's like, okay, the way that men determine, determine equality with each other is through accountability. If a man will not be accountable, he will not stand shoulder to shoulder with other men. The, you know, the price of your man card is accountability. That's just a known thing. A man who is not accountable does not get to be part of the circle. So if women want to be equal to men, they have to take on the burden of men, which is accountability. If you want to truly be equal, women do not like accountability. And in my observation, they do almost anything they can to avoid accountability. You know, uh, if, if you listen to Kevin Samuels, he talks about sign language, shame, insults, guilt, and the need to be right. As he tries to make it clear to them that, you know, the life choices, the women that have that call into them, the ones that they've made, are not serving them. They're not getting the men their life that they want. And so when he tries to explain to them this is as a result of your choices, they resort to shame, insults, guilt, and the need to be right, all in the process of avoiding accountability. And so if women want to come into true equality with men, not political equality, not economic equality, but true shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder divine equality with men, there will be a process of accountability. And many of the men in here know that I speak about the great reconciliation. And I think sometimes I may do myself a disservice in talking about it in that I can almost accidentally, though not intentionally, accidentally frame it as this magical coming together process, and I don't believe that. I don't believe it'll be magical at all, one happy day where we all wake up and everything's happy and fine. No, there's going to be a process of accountability, and the problem is that accountability burns. Accountability is pain. No one wants to experience accountability. And the real challenging thing will be women will have to go through a process of accountability. Individual women, and I think women collectively, for the things that they have done and the choices that they have made, whether they did it under deception or not. And the real challenge for us as men will be holding women as they go through that process. We will have to be strong enough to support women as they go through the process of accountability and feel the consequences of their choices. And that's going to be absolutely brutal, but it's going to be absolutely wonderful and beautiful by the end because it will bring men and women closer together. So in the hope that taking the long view, we never have to make this mistake again, this generational error we've made for the past 60 years, that maybe this is the lesson that humanity needs to learn, that some things can't be undone. And so that's my hope for the long term, that as we mutually go through this process of accountability, supporting each other in that, that humanity can learn the lessons that it needs to learn. So that's my response to this. Well said. Thank Very you. Well said. Thank you, guys. Um, well, uh, so I, we have just a, we do have just a few minutes left, and uh, so I just, for anyone who wants to jump in, sort of popcorn style, if, do you have any advice to women that are listening right now, or uh, potentially also men with girlfriends who, or wives that they want to try and explain some of these concepts to, how to begin reaching across, you know, what we might say the aisle, um, and inviting more women into this process? Anyone who wants to jump in. I got a quick thing, actually, it's not from me, it's from Jennifer Moleski, <coughs> speaker, oh, sure. spoke at 22 convention. I had to rearrange the schedule a little bit, that was on me, and she had to then leave on an airplane, that's why she's not here right now. She was otherwise gonna be on this panel. She actually wanted me to tell you guys on her behalf that feminism is stupid and don't trust the government. <laughs> I promised her I would do that, so I gotta do that. So she's here in spirit. Yeah. That's all from Jennifer. Okay. I guess um, social media is very dangerous for women in yeah. a way. It's like pornography, how it's especially emasculating for men. Yeah. Um, social media inflates a woman's uh, self-estimation, also her expectations. It's, I would say, limit. I do tell guys, check out, check out their social media, their Instagram, yeah. especially if you find the burner account that their parents don't know about, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and see what they're posting. I would say it's not good. It's not good at all. Uh, women want to compete with each other naturally. You see this even the church with homeschool moms, right? They're competing through their kids. Mm -hmm. But Instagram, uh, there's, that's one thing that I would say back off on that. Uh, that's a good step right there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, even if it's the trad account stuff, it's just, I mean, I hate the word LARPing, but my goodness, yeah, what else sure. is it? There's a lot of that. You know, that's, that's one practical step. Cool. Alexander? 
Um, I prefer, yeah, for the young women that contact me, I have a fairly objective criteria. It's not dissimilar to what I give young men, but you have to set some standards for yourself. Because if you hold yourself to standards you know, by default, then you know, the level of your life, the vibration of your life will rise. You know, the thing I often suggest, obviously, is like your physical health, your personal health. Mm -hmm. yeah, take care of that. You know, the people that you have relationships with are those ascendant or descending relationships. Is it making you better or worse? The way you treat people, one of the things that a lot of young women, or just women in general, lack today is that they're not nurturing. They don't know how to be graceful. They've adopted this sort of, what's essentially like a shitty male version of dealing with people where it's very brassy, it's very ballsy, it's very abrasive. Um, and there might be certain environments that that works in, but overall, you're just an unpleasant, unpleasant woman. Nobody likes you. Nobody wants to be around you. You're relying upon, you know, title and authority to, you know, to uh, coerce people. So have standards for how you treat people. Like actually practice being kind. Like you develop that quality in yourself. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, beyond that, like in regards to like relationships with men, you know, try to actually apply some logic to it. Like, yeah, this is one of the, this is like the maturation process of like feminine wisdom. If you actually are going to be a woman and be wise, you need to learn how to balance intuition and feeling with logic and reason. Like that actually has to happen. Like that not everything you feel is valid. Not, not every emotion needs to be satisfied. You know, that when you look at someone or you're looking at a man like, okay, let me, let me check my expectations a little bit about how this is going to proceed. Yeah. I mean, this all comes to time. This is obviously experiential. This isn't, you know, like as we've been saying, it's not done in a day, but this actually, this makes you more mature. Yeah, and if you are looking at your future and you're a young lady, it's like, okay, like you're, you're setting yourself up on the right path, on the right-hand path. Um, if you want to give in to hedonism and listen to your stupid, shitty friends and disregard your personal health and make decisions that are disrespectful to you, you're going to get what you're going to get. Yep. Yeah, and then you're going to be that girl that's really upset when she feels like she's being shamed and beat on. But you know what? You probably earned it. Yeah. Sock, you got about 90 seconds. 90 seconds. I, yep. I think women need to clean their own house first and not focusing on the patriarchy. I think that in many cases, feminism is nothing more than a form of gender bigotry, and that when you partake in it, you're a bigot. When you enable bigotry, you're enabling bigotry. And we need to view it as such, and ladies, you need to clean house and speak up. When you see it, you need to silence that. You need to call attention to it and shine a light on it. Men are watching. Brilliant. And to that, I would just add um, courage. It's okay to be wrong. It has never been more okay to be wrong. So I want to thank you guys for sitting on this panel. Socrates, Alexander, Michael, Mr. President, sir, Will Spencer, if anyone has you got about 50 seconds left, if anyone got something burning they want to say. Yeah, I had a little something, unless you want to go, Michael. Yeah, so one of, I said a tweet when the New York Post was fighting with us in 2020 about Make Women Great Again launching it. And I was kind of messing around, but I realized later there was merit to it. And I said in a tweet, all caps, just kind of yelling late at night right on Twitter, you know, reclaim your stolen femininity, become great again. And they quoted that like on the website. They actually like embedded it. I was like, that's interesting. And it, so it kind of made me think more about it. And so one of the ways we talking about feminism lied to women. These are lies, blue pill lies, whatever. You should also think about it that it's they robbed you. They stole your femininity from you, especially if you're a young woman. It wasn't just that you got lied and you accepted the lie and you're responsible for that part. And they're responsible for lying to you. That's like abusive and stupid. But they also robbed you. They stole from you. Really, like they stole from you psychologically and culturally and spiritually, I would say. And that's messed up. And that's just another way to look at it that I think is useful beyond just you were lied to. They robbed you, straight up. Thanks, gentlemen. It's still on. This is Will Spencer from the Renaissance of Men live in Orlando, Florida with the 21 Summit 2021 with Socrates, Alexander Cortez, Pastor Michael Foster, and President Anthony Dream Johnson, the state of women and femininity. Thanks so much for watching. Welcome back to the 21 Convention Second Patriarch Edition live in Orlando, Florida. Welcome to the 22 Convention. Welcome back to the 21 Convention 2020 of Orlando, Florida, being held for the first time ever at our very first and inaugural 21 Summit event. Welcome to 21 Summit in Orlando, Florida.
Well, here we go. We risked again with the 22 convention, the Patriarch and 21 convention, all three stages together in one event. Not only did we sit down and say we're gonna to come together and meet in mass, but we're gonna take it a step further. We are gonna dare have a conversation about the sexes, openly, honestly, and engage the woman that could been. Like, I am amazed at how well this went. We did a brand new event, we did the second Patriarch, and we did the main event for the 19th time. It's so much more than sitting in an audience watching a man on a stage. The conversations in the hallways, the connections that people make, the challenging, the collaborations. And that's what we need. It all starts with men. And it's not just men. That's what I like about this. You know, we don't want to like overreact uh, to feminism and then, and then hate women. That's not it. This is about men getting their act together, doing what they're made to do. You had meals. You had to run security. You had to run travel plans. You had to ensure people were where they needed to be. Three stages, cameras everywhere, and it was pulled off with, with flawless execution. It's evolved so much. Um, I really appreciate how Anthony has allowed you speakers to evolve and to grow and to share that and to encourage that with all the other men here. Um, to hear so much talk on family and fatherhood. There's more depth, there's more room for who they could be. Is the word patriarchy or patriarch offensive to you in any way? Not to me personally. Okay. Not at all. It's something that I, I cherish it. I love it. I grew up. You cherish it. the patriarchy. I do. In mansplaining news, a three day conference for women led by men hopes to make women great again. Well, women need to be taught how to be great again. Oh, Not my yes, words. We do. Like how to land a husband, <gasps> how to lose weight, how to pop out a bunch of kids. Why do men think they need to fix the problems of women? Well, it says the world's ultimate event for women. In Orlando, Florida, that's going to be the scene of the crime. It's mansplaining palooza. You say no to the toxic bullying feminist dogma. <laughs> Patriarchy is the future. It's good to see it in person. I'm just, until I got here and saw it, and you can see the people in the audience, you see the men that are here committed to listening. I mean, it's just, change my idea of what the conference is. The professionalism, the staff, the way everything is organized, yeah. it's given me a different perspective about this particular idea and I'm ready to put some more fire into it. Welcome to Dream World, ladies and gentlemen.